here. Put v equal to zero, what happens? We get two times log u, right, or log of u squared. So it, it increases as you go on out that way, right? Um, and then over here, this, this, this one, if you just look at the real component here, if you put, uh, obviously if you put y equals plus or minus x, you're going to minus infinity, right? And if you go on out the y-axis, you're just going like log of absolute value y squared. It's the same behavior. But yes, in this case, this idea of conformal mapping is really simple. All it says is you just switch the roles of x and y, right? It's a much more mundane example of this idea than the one I just erased. But the thing is, we can do this for more complicated hyperbolic functions, right? And I still have the question of, you know, what, what can we learn about that? What does it mean? What does it tell us? The paper I wanted to look at you with you guys today, but, you know, obviously I've as usual, I, every time I think I can teach conformal mapping, I always inevitably don't have a chance to prepare beforehand, and it takes me an hour to remember it. But I think it's actually useful to see me do this because it helps you guys think through it. I hope it actually accomplished something today. I don't know if it didn't. I'm sorry. But in this paper, Hyperbolic Calculus by um, Mater and Rosa, basically they developed the hyperbolic calculus from scratch, kind of. Talk about it anyway. Um, and eventually, um, they reference a uh, book on, oh, I left that at home too, curses. Um, they um, eventually look at this transformation, like here. They, um, and then they, they look at, here's the other picture in here, this thing. And so I believe what's going on here, and this is what I want to look at with you guys next time, since I didn't get to it this time. Sorry about that. Um, well, I still want to see what you did, King, with the uh, m, m sub a equals to root 3. But, uh, yeah. Um, so let me just tell you, let me give you, I, I read this paper this morning, so it's kind of fresh in my mind a little bit. Um, they identify the hyperbolic plane with space-time. So if you look at the condition that your function from the hyperbolic plane to the hyperbolic plane be hyperbolic differentiable, that means that the Jacobian has the form basically ABBA. Well, that's the same pattern for a Lorentz transformation. A Lorentz transformation has the same pattern, um, like Kosh cinch, cinch, kosh, that's a boost. And um, so they, he makes some connections with interpreting the hyperbolic numbers as space-time. And then with respect to that identification, he looks at a particular hyperbolic transformation which corresponds somehow to a uniformly accelerated rigid rod. And then he claims to have solved the wave equation on the uniformly accelerated rigid rod by using this, essentially using this technique I'm showing you guys. Um, but he did not do it the way I just did it. He relies on a paper which is a preprint. And reading between the lines, I think what he's doing is using the thing I showed you guys last time about the, uh, he also has the Dell-Embertian thing in here. But he doesn't have, he isn't, he, the words, hey, there's an isomorphism to the direct product algebra, that's not in here. He just refers to another paper, which I don't have, to, to pull out the Dell-Embertian solution. But I'd like to, I know there's some things in here that I think are, are really kind of intriguing. Um, um, show you. Where was that thing I was going to tell you? 
So, for example, you guys know how um, if we integrate, this, this to me is one of the most intriguing things I wanted to look at with you guys. It doesn't really have directly anything to do with this per se, but I just think it was interesting. Um, on page 117 of this paper, Hyperbolic cal cal Calculus by Mater and Rosa, is a paper from uh, Advances in Applied Clifford Analysis, number one from 1998, when I was just leaving the uh, community college. But um, <clears throat> anyway, the integral in the hyperbolic plane, so do you guys know what happens if you look at the integral of dz over z over like a circle? Center of the origin. What's this equal to? Well, not a whole circle, but suppose this is a Suppose this is delta theta. If delta theta was 2 pi, you'd be right. It'd be 2 pi i. Yeah, I okay. yeah I, just i delta theta, right? So in this paper, he shows that the integral of dz over z is something like uh, h times Vf minus Vi. Here, let me clarify that. J. Well, those are the rapidities. Those are the, the hyperbolic angles. And that is a hyperbola. But it has to be a hyperbola that like fits inside like here. It can't, it can't cross the zero divisors, I think, is the thing. So I, anyway, I think, I think understanding this paper would bring you much closer to being kind of really more deeply understand hyperbolic calculus in the same way we understand complex, or closer to that anyway. We'd be, we'd be more aware of how things work out. Yeah. Just this is this is a hyper this is a hyperbola, which lies between zero divisors. He does not. This is not a circle, not a circle. This is a hyperbola. And a, a well-behaved hyperbola. So. Anyway. Now we can see if there's some connection with the the Minkowski term and the uh, and then. But you have a circle and the x squared and minus oh plus y y squared equals something. Uh huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I, ideally I was going to work this out with you guys and like try to understand more about this paper. I'm not sure how much of it we should. It might be better to keep pursuing this direction, try to look at some more examples in here. Um, do you have some that we should? Uh-oh. Well, anyway, we're done. So, thanks, guys.